and welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So we are in our section on calibration, yeah? calibration of the discrete forward rate term structure model. Okay, so now I'd like to finish our session on calibration with say a few remarks, maybe also a bit more general remarks. Um, yeah, and also I have a small numerical experiment where we will use, for example, our analytic formula yeah, that we derived here in this section for the swaptions to calibrate the model and then compare this calibration or this formula to the Monte Carlo valuation. Yeah, so how good is actually this analytic formula which we um, derived? And this maybe then also leads to a few insights yeah, on, on calibration in, in general. So first remark, yeah, what we have uh, encountered is that yeah, calibration is usually computationally demanding. Yeah? It is the inversion of a very complicated function. Model parameters enter into your model, could be become a Monte Carlo simulation, take the expectation of the valuation of financial products yeah, and then map to observed prices. It's the inversion of a very complicated functions. And we have several options to ease this problem. We can find an analytic approximation to speed this up. So I can avoid the Monte Carlo simulation. I could try to decouple parameters uh, and do some bootstrapping. Yeah. So you have seen uh, many examples for this. Also in the calibration of the forward rate curve, there is bootstrapping by calibrating forward rates maturity per maturity to observed swaps, observed zero copper bonds. This is also a decoupling. Or in the previous session, nice example, derive a bootstrap algorithm for the swaptions by observing that the dependency structure is that you can calibrate one additional parameter to a specific problem product, then fix the previous parameters and continue with the next one. So this kind of decoupling is then yeah, uh, sometimes called bootstrapping you know, because you do it one by the other. This is also a huge speed improvement if you can do bootstrapping because an n-dimensional root finder, so instead of having a function that goes from Rn parameters to Rn products, you have n functions, Fi going from say R to R, uh, you calibrate each product individually. So this here could be order n squared because, for, so for example, if you use levenberg marquardt optimizer, you have to calculate the derivative of the function, the derivative of every output value to every input parameter. And if you have this kind of decoupling, the derivative function is maybe a triangular matrix, like for a swaption, yeah? So, uh, so, so the current parameter do not influence past products. So you have kind of a triangular matrix. So then you could have something that is actually n times every parameter order one, yeah, which is much faster. So this is here uh, for a remark for the bootstrapping. But then in the end, yeah, sometimes you cannot find an analytic approximation. The dependence structure is unclear. Yeah, of course, then I'm also a lazy guy and then I just do brute force Monte Carlo calibration and I just throw compute power on it. Yeah, so maybe you could use some GPU uh, computing to um, speed up yeah, your numerical algorithm. That's also an option. So we have three things here, uh, analytic approximation, bootstrapping, or use compute power to, to improve this. 
Now, interesting, studying a little bit, uh, what does it mean to um, have a calibration error? If I have a numerical method underneath, yeah? So let's have a look, say, between these two things. Do brute force Monte Carlo calibration, change the parameter in my Monte Carlo algorithm, Uh, calculate the product, yeah, optimize uh, the parameter, calculate the product by Monte Carlo, or use an analytic approximation because there are different errors now involved. Here I have an error related to the approximation formula, but here I have maybe an error related to the numerical algorithm, yeah, brute force Monte Carlo. So a first remark on the calibration error, and this um, relates then to the analytic formula. If the setup that is used for the calibration of the parameters is different from the setup that is used for your application, well, so after calibration, then there is an additional calibration error resulting from this difference. Yeah? We have used the analytic approximation in the calibration, but then we use these parameters in our Monte Carlo simulation. This, the reason is that the calibration has some, somehow sucked up the approximation error of our analytic approximation. So this difference can be due to using an analytic approximation to perform the calibration and then later use these parameters in a Monte Carlo evaluation. So you see that calibration could consume an error. And sometimes this is a nice property. Yeah? So if you have now an identical setup, so using an identical, for example, a numerical setup for a calibration on one side and valuation on the other side, Then if your algorithm, if your product valuation has a numerical error, the calibration algorithm compares your numerical valuation with the observed quantity on the market and tells you, okay, you have to modify your model parameter to remove this error, this calibration error, which is actually a numerical error. So you will not calibrate for example, the true analytic parameter, you will calibrate the parameter that if it is used in, numer in your numerical implementation, reproduces the correct result. This is nice, yeah, because you can calibrate the numerical error away. Your numerical model reproduces exactly what you observe. The numerical error has been consumed by the calibration uh, parameter. So the effect here is that your calibration will absorb the numerical errors into the calibration parameter. Nice feature, yeah? maybe an advantage. Yeah? Removes numerical errors very elegantly looks a little bit like what we did for control variants, yeah? removes numerical errors elegantly. However, it can be uh, dangerous. Yeah? So that's the tip. Now comes the corresponding warning. Yeah? So compensating numerical errors by calibration may be dangerous because it hides the numerical error. Yeah. The model looks accurate, but only on the calibration product. So it could be that on other financial products, the model is not very good yeah, because yeah, somehow 
it's only by chance very, very accurate on the calibration product. Huh? But uh, maybe it is numerically still, say, unstable. Yeah? We, we, ha we have an example now. So it's important to check the numerical accuracy of the model, maybe on other products, or for example, if it is a Monte Carlo model with different Monte Carlo seeds, to see how large is actually, for example, the Monte Carlo error that is hidden in your model, model parameter. So let's study this in this small experiment. So I have an experiment here in our experiment repository. So you find this, it's always here. It's in the package Monte Carlo interest rates and it is called LIBOR market model so our discrete term structure forward rate model calibration ATM test yeah ATM because I only calibrate at the money swaptions so we have the strike is equal to the uh, swap rate so let's have a look at this little example so i'm here in the package interest rates there is here this calibration atm test um, i can calibrate different models using two different strategies say monte carlo or analytic so let's have a look how they differ so i will make different experiments here uh, where i have a normal model uh, so it is a normal model normal dynamics and um, I calibrate with my analytic formula or I calibrate with my true Monte Carlo valuation of a swap chain. So um, let's have a look. Here is my set of calibration products. They are different starting times of the swap and different length of the swap. Yeah? So the end time of the swap will be the starting time plus the end time. And I have a set of observed, observed normal volatility. So this is the stuff that I, I have observed on the market. Yeah? So I generate all these uh, swaps. So you see there is um, that I now loop over all this uh, given market data and then I have here a small helper function create calibration item which is just below uh, where you can see that I create um, two implementations of my model one is just a Monte Carlo valuation it's this swaption here a very simple swaption okay so what's what's this guy doing yeah, it, it's using this implementation here, the swaption, and it's converting to this, uh, this, this value, which is calculated by this swaption. It's just converting it to, say, an implied uh, volatility. Yeah, it's just a small helper function. So if you like to have a look at the valuation, you have to open this, this swaption here. Yeah? So you see, um, it's just a loop over all uh, periods. For each period, take the forward rate minus the swap rate multiplied with the period length. Yeah? And then in the end, take the maximum of this. Yeah? So exercise uh, the option. Okay, so that's just my Monte Carlo evaluation and I also have besides here the Monte Carlo evaluation I also have the analytic formula so this is the analytic formula yeah we have studied in the previous session yeah the formula that takes the integrated covariance here and multiplies with the swap rate weights yeah from the left and the right so this is our analytic formula so I create these two different products either analytic, either Monte Carlo. Okay, so out of this data. And then I build my, my model. 
So my model has a volatility model. So you see the volatility model is actually this class here, volatility model piecewise constant. So it's a very high parametric model. I have many different forward rate volatility parameters. Yeah. Um, my correlation model is just given. It's a very simple one, the exponential decay model. So I feed these two, the volatility model and the correlation model, I feed it here into this covariance model. Okay, and then I have this covariance model and I construct the pound in motion and then I construct my model. Okay, and here is a function that performs the calibration. Yeah? So you can pass here these calibration products to this function and it will perform the calibration. So now you think, okay, where is the calibration now deciding if it is analytic or if it is Monte Carlo? Yeah. So if you if you look into this here, uh, you will see there is no difference made if it is analytic or Monte Carlo. And that's a little trick that is hidden a little bit in the implementation. The implementation uses our technique of lazy initialization. So the Monte Carlo simulation is only generated if a future forward rate is requested. So if the calibration product is an analytic formula that does not require a future forward rate, then no Monte Carlo simulation is performed. Yeah. So I'm using here my implementation trick, lazy initialization. So forward rate Euler scheme is only generated once I ask for a forward rate and the random numbers of my Brownian motions are only generated once the Euler scheme asks for the random numbers. So the funny thing is that if I have this lazy in it, my calibration algorithm will be very fast if I use my analytic formula because he will just skip the step of performing the Monte Carlo simulation and just use in this get value routine the analytic formula to calculate the swaption value. Okay, so maybe you can check this with your debugger. Yeah, you could go into your Brownian motion, yeah, and check that in the Brownian motion there's nothing done. Yeah, if um, you evaluate an analytic product with this model. Yeah? So you see here in this Brownian motion implementation, there's always this little trick. Only if you call, give me the Brownian increment, then this here is lazy initialization, I generate the Brownian motion. Yeah? So in the constructor, I just remember the parameters, but I do not generate the random numbers. Yeah, this is a nice little trick. Okay, and um, then I specify what kind of optimizer he should use. So I use here a Levenberg Marquardt optimizer, either on my analytic formula or on my um, Monte Carlo simulation. And I perform then the, the calibration. So once the calibration is done, well, I check how long has it taken. And then I like to check how good is the calibration. And now I construct the model again. Yeah. So you see, I construct here the model again, a benchmark model. And on this model, I now evaluate all my financial products again. Okay, so, and compare with the target values, which we, which we would like to observe, yeah. So, but I do not um, calculate the calibration product. I also calculate something which is called benchmark product. And the difference between the benchmark product and the calibration product
is just here. Yeah? So I have two different set of products. And while the calibration product can be either analytic or Monte Carlo, my benchmark product is always a Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so what can I do? I can now compare different model parameters, yeah, number of sample paths, for example, with calibrate with an analytic formula and compare to the Monte Carlo valuation benchmark or calibrate with the Monte Carlo and compare to the Monte Carlo valuation. So this is maybe ugly complicated code. It's much nicer to see what's happening if we run this guy. So now this guy runs. Well, if you like for fun, you can also observe a little bit the CPU usage. So I start with a model that uses analytic products for calibration. And you see the calibration is quite fast, yeah, five seconds. There's still a numerical optimizer on the outside. It's a high parametric model. Yeah? Don't have counted the number of parameters, maybe 100 different parameters that he has to optimize. So he takes quite a while, even with this analytic formula. And you see the calibration is really, really good. Yeah, the expected error is zero. The root mean square of the error yeah, is 0.006%. Yeah, it's quite good. But now if you perform the calculation with these calibrated parameters, calibrated using the analytic formula, if you now recalculate the products using the Monte Carlo simulation, you see that actually there is a fairly large error. So I'm having a Monte Carlo simulation only with 1,000 paths. So we have the question, where does this error come from? So I have these results also here on the slides. You see, it is the same slide. And here, I have a very good calibration. Yeah, oh, decent good, decently good. This calibration is done using the analytic formula. But if I now check the calibration using the Monte Carlo, I observe that I have a large error. And where does the error come from? That's not clear. So what do I mean with calibration? I mean that is it maybe the approximation formula? Okay, yeah, so here our analytic approximation formula. Or is it that we are using Monte Carlo? Well, it could be Monte Carlo because uh, I use only very few sample paths. What happens if I calibrate with Monte Carlo? Yeah, I also get a very good result. Calibration error yeah, in average zero. Yeah. This is the, the, the target of the optimizer. Yeah. Reduce the root mean square. So the average will be uh, zero. The RMS is 0.007, yeah, so similar to here. And also, if you now check with the Monte Carlo, of course, you get the same result. Yeah, you get the same result because you just use stupidly the same model, yeah? So your benchmark is just verifying that your numerical root finder has reported the right values. Yeah? I use the same model. So I don't know really, is this model good?
So the, the thing is that your calibration with Monte Carlo has hidden the error from the previous situation inside the calibration parameters. Okay, to check this, let's use a Monte Carlo model with more sample paths. Uh, so I calibrate with my 1000 sample paths Monte Carlo. But now I use as a benchmark a Monte Carlo. Okay, I hope that my Monte Carlo converges, a Monte Carlo which with much more sample paths. And then you see that while your calibration looked good, your Monte Carlo error appears to be high. Yeah, Your Monte Carlo has not converged because if you now use a model with the same parameters and many, well, yeah, 10 times more Monte Carlo sample paths, you see um, a large error again. So conclusion is that these parameters here in this model have consumed a large Monte Carlo error. So the parameters here have absorbed a large Monte Carlo error. So while here, it could be that we think, okay, Obviously, our analytic formula is not very good because if I use my analytic formula, uh, I have results that look good. But if I then use my Monte Carlo model, the results are no longer good. While here you could think it is the analytic formula, it is just the Monte Carlo error that uh, appears here. Yeah? Because look at the size here. Yeah, This is 0 0.02 or 3. This is here 0 0.02 or 3. Yeah. So this is the same order of magnitude. Yeah. So this could be the Monte Carlo error. So in the background here, my guy moved on. Yeah. So I have more examples. So that's here the example we just did, yeah, I use a Monte Carlo with uh, a larger number of sample paths as a benchmark. So next thing, if this is the Monte Carlo error, yeah, what happens if I do the analytic calibration and then compare it with the benchmark that used the many Monte Carlo sample paths, you see uh, analytic is really, really, really 10 times faster here than uh, the Monte Carlo, although this Monte Carlo is maybe not good enough because it just uses 10,000 passes. And you see then uh, it looks as if the analytic and the Monte Carlo are quite close together. You know? So that's the next step. Uh, benchmark the analytic calibration with the Monte Carlo benchmark. Yeah, so my Monte Carlo benchmark uses now 10,000 paths. Here, um, the number of sample paths is not relevant yeah, because it is analytic. My calibration algorithm performs a good calibration and the calibration remains quite good if I try to verify it with the Monte Carlo. Yeah? yeah, here I don't know, is it Monte Carlo, that error that I see? 
just, I mean, I have used 10 times more sample paths. So the Monte Carlo error should have become smaller. Yeah, square root of 10, so maybe by uh, one third. Um, or is it now, is this the error that comes from using an approximation formula? So maybe I have to increase again the number of sample paths to verify this. So I use now Monte Carlo with the 10,000 sample paths. So my previous benchmark is a calibration against the Monte Carlo with even more sample paths, 50,000. Okay, and you see there's still a small uh, Monte Carlo error that you yeah, that you see, uh, but it is already small. Yeah, so maybe calibrating with ten thousand uh, sample path is uh, is okay. But now compare the times calibrating here with ten thousand sample paths. Took me some four minutes calibrating here analytically took me uh, four, four seconds yeah? and um, we have a similar result. So this is now my analytic calibration benchmarked against my Monte Carlo with the very high number of sample paths, 50,000. Again, this guy here does not matter. And you see that the result is similar to calibrating with 10,000 sample paths, okay? So you can achieve four minutes to four seconds. So a factor of 60 improvement uh, using our analytic formula. And the analytic formula appears to be quite good. Yeah? So you see the difference in this calibration brute force to analytic formula only if you go to very high number of sample paths where uh, you maybe require some some additional stuff to speed up yeah, the numerical algorithm. Um, yeah, to, to to have a feasible calibration. Yeah, four minutes uh, in 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 the industry is already maybe too too long. Okay, so that was it for calibration. Uh, in my script, I have a few summaries. Yeah, so reminder um, analytic calibration. So you might also run this test here, which does a, a few more analytic calibrations. Um, just a small. A reminder what is bootstrapping. Yeah, I have explained that bootstrapping is the special case where you have a function from Rn to Rn and you can uh, say decouple the problem of looking at such a high dimensional function to looking at a sequence of one dimensional problem, n one dimensional problems where you just solve for a fixed parameter xi, yeah, having the previous parameters already uh, calibrated and having the nice property that your problem does not depend on the other parameters. Yeah? That's bootstrapping, gives you uh, an improvement order n squared to order n, yeah? depending on the algorithm you use. And that was it for calibration. That's a section on the Levenberg Marquardt optimizer, the optimizer that I used uh, in the code. Yeah, that was it for today. Thanks.